Hello, everybody. We're going to start in a couple of minutes, but I did want to make an announcement that um, our beloved colleagues from UIUC cannot be here today. They got trapped in Champaign-Urbana. So if you're here to hear their talk, you might want to think about uh, another session. We'll be talking about... You won't be insulted. We won't be insulted. So, uh, so the only presentation today will be on the, the Bibflow project at UC Davis. Um, and Tim and his colleagues and their deep regrets, but they were... I think it was freezing fog or something, and they, they just couldn't even get to Chicago, so they sent their apologies. people took our advice. Yeah. yeah, no. Okay, it's five past the hour, so I think we're safe to start now. I'm sure people will trickle in from lunch, but I want to keep us on time. We have a luxury of time since there's only one presentation, <laughs> but that's good because it's a big project, so we'll have ample time to talk about it and leave some time for discussion at the end. So my name is Mackenzie Smith, and I'm the university librarian at the University of California Davis campus and the PI on this project. Um, and I'm going to just give you a little bit of context for it, for those of you who have not heard presentations on this before, and then I'm going to turn it over to the person who's really doing all the work and introduce him in a minute. So um, Vibflow is a project funded by the IMLS, and um, it was the culmination of many years of observation on my part that we, in the library world, when it comes to operations, technical services, we're living in the 1970s. We have uh, MARC and other standards that were developed many, many decades ago. We have um, technologies, integrated library systems that were architected and written many, many decades ago, and they have evolved. But in some really fundamental ways, both the infrastructure that we're using and the workflows um, have not really kept up with the modern world, and in particular, the web and uh, linked data. So in previous institutions, I worked on projects to try to integrate all this great library data that we have um, across many different silos. So you've got MARC, you've got EAD finding aids, you've got um, GIS data, you've got DDI data, you've got many, many buckets of data and very poor ways to integrate and navigate and exploit that data um, to support the library's activities. So uh, we decided to take on the challenge of thinking about what it would look like if the whole library operation flipped to linked data from the ground up. You know, and then how would we get from here to there? And that's really what the Bibflow project is about. It's about developing a roadmap to help the library community and our technical services operations get from where we are today, which is kind of the 1970s with a little lipstick on it, to 2020, which is where we're going to be very soon. So this has been a very uh, long and arduous project, and there are lots of other people here in this room working on various other aspects of linked data, but this one was really focused on that back-end operation that, as a library director, I'm spending a lot of money on and could be done much, much more efficiently. So that's the context of the project, and to kind of, we're just wrapping it up now after two and a half years or so, and so this is kind of the final findings of the project that we'll be sharing with you today. And to do that, I'll introduce my colleague, Carl Stamer, who is the head of our data and digital scholarship department at the UC Davis Library and formerly the director of digital scholarship and has a, a long and storied background in linked data, ontologies, and um, kind of the future of data standards. So he's the perfect person to lead you through this work. Thanks, Carl. All right. So uh, what I'm going to do is give a, this is a high altitude view of what is in the roadmap itself. So that roadmap will come out within, we'll deliver it to IMLS by the 29th. It has to be there. So <laughs> it will definitely be available then. Uh, but hopefully within a week from now, actually, we'll start uh, publishing it online 
so that people can get to it. And it has a lot more detail behind the things that I'm going to talk about today. Um, one of the sort of premise there is that we actually have a dual axis of transformation that has to happen here. We have to transform our data, but we also have to transform all of the systems that surround that data. And that's uh, both human and machine. So workflows that are in place and also uh, software. We have a lot of different software systems and sort of machine systems in, our, in the library that also communicate with that data. So it's a large scale effort to try to, as Mackenzie said, actually from the ground up, change everything. I'm not going to, this isn't a technical talk, so I'm gonna try really hard not to get down in the weeds of like what linked data is and how it works, but a, just a couple key concepts I wanna to touch on quickly because if you don't just have these key concepts, the rest of the talk is not gonna make much sense. So the one thing, uh, first thing I'm gonna talk about is something that you'll hear me say probably quite a bit, which is a linked data ecosystem. When I talk about a linked data ecosystem, what I mean is a fully functioning linked data library where everything we're doing is now in a linked data space. You see in the visualization that that has these four discrete uh, areas that, are, uh, that we've identified. One is our cataloging. We need our cataloging to actually happen to take advantage of linked data, not just have the same records be produced and converted to linked data. We've got uh, linked data exchange. So instead of exchanging MARC records with other libraries, that we would actually be exchanging data as linked data, as triples. I'm working my way around counterclockwise. We've got linked data discovery. So now we've spent a lot of time making the, our data as linked data. How does that going to affect our discovery universe? Right? Hopefully a lot, actually, because there's a lot of new cool things we can do. And then finally, the shaded out uh, block that you see there is linked data storage storing our data as a triple store natively. And the plan that I'm gonna outline is designed to get to that, but I, I do feel obligated to say that that's not really, one could operate fully in a linked data ecosystem without doing that. Because the data layer is often not based on whatever your real standard is the way you think of it. So a lot of people think that, um, real quick here, if I look at it, it's a this is where I'm gonna get a little technical, but I'm gonna do it. If you think about the way software gets architected, this uh, model view controller is something that came out quite a while, people that do software development, and most of the ILSs that you are using work this way, where your model is your data store, and it lives separate, like it has its own universe, and then you have these two other components that interact with it. You have your view is your user interface. That's how you interact with your universe with the data universe, and you have a controller which you know, like does the math, two times two is four, convert this string you know, to all uppercase. So the functionality is happening there, but all the data lives in this data layer in the model. And already in your current ILS, that model is not a mark record, and it is not mark based. So this is just a snippet of a small thing from the Qualiole um, ILS system, which I'll call even though it's not technically an ILS, but it's easier to say. Um, you know, it, there's some like 450 tables, like several thousands of fields, you know, that drive that product. If you look around, you can find Markness in it, but it is definitively not a Mark record, you know, behind the product. That's the same for all your ILSs. So, um, you know, and yet they deliver Mark. When people catalog, their view looks like Mark. We exchange Mark. So it's not imperative that your data store become a native triple store, but I'm gonna talk about reasons why I actually think you should do that. So the other key concept that you have to have is the concept of a URI. And I'm, again, I'm gonna try not to go into the weeds of linked data, but a URI is a unique identifier. It's a, it's a fancy name for a unique identifier, just like we already have IDs that are unique in a lot of different databases. The key difference being that we would, in linked data land, share those, right? In the same way that we share a particularly formatted string now, but that URI is designed to be machine readable. The computer knows how to do something with it. And so in the example I put up here, we see a sort of human statement, which would be that Shakespeare William 1564 to whatever his date is, 1616, right? And that's the properly formatted string. You know, he authored this work Hamlet. In the bottom example, you see how that would be configured in linked data. We have the URI for Shakespeare, that unique identifier, and then the label 
of the name. But the label, it's just a, the name's a label now, it's not the thing. And then we have another URI, which is a Mark Relater code that we've used from Library of Congress that if this was authored. And um, then we have an OCLC work ID for Hamlet, right? So um, these URIs are really the key to what makes linked data work. Right, so this graph you're looking at right here is something I just threw up really quickly. It's one of my favorite examples where I looked in Wikipedia. Wikipedia exposes as Wikidata all the stuff there as linked data. And so I'm able to traverse various sources and just quickly create this graph. But that graph only works because we have a, the URIs there. It keys on those URIs. If they weren't all using the same URI, if a bunch of people weren't using the same URI for Quentin Tarantino, none of these connections would, would work. And you end up with what I call linkless open data, right? If we all just minted different URIs, none of them talked, there'd be no advantage here. So that URI really is the heart and soul of linked data. RDF matters, triple stores matter, all of that, but what really matters is that we're sharing URIs. Uh, without that, your linked data is not worth much, even though I could formulate it as triples. So what we have, that's the end of my tech uh, drill down. Now we're going to get back to the, the process. So the process we've identified is a two-phase process that's designed to move a library from their complete mark universe up to total native linked data operations. And it, importantly though, the reason it's two phases is because, as I'll go through and describe each step, it, phase one is not that expensive. There aren't that many barriers to doing that. And if you move through phase one, you could actually be minimally functioning in a linked data universe. Um, you, you won't be able to capitalize on everything, but you, will, you could actually put out RDF, exchange RDF with people, and you'd be working functionally in a linked data universe. Phase two takes you past that to really your full workflows and back end supporting that. And so the key to that phase one is having your mark and eating it too, which is that you can, you can still, and this is the reason why it's cheap and there's not a big barrier for entry, the whole concept behind phase one is that almost entirely you don't have to change your workflow at all. Your catalogers can still work in their mark land, right, but we're doing just a few crucial things to set ourselves up for that linked data transformation. So the, in the first thing we're doing, the first step of this is getting URIs inserted in our mark data, right? So the theory being that if we cataloged in mark, but every place there was a name or a subject or those things that we already pivot on, we were also getting a URI into that universe, then we'd be setting our data up for good transformation to linked data because we now have a map between the label that we use and the URI. And happily, it's pretty easy to do this, actually. So this is, a, a, again, a screenshot from Qualiole, their Describe universe, where we were able to go in and, in, and I mean this seriously, about 45 minutes that it took to code in an auto lookup to Library of Congress using their linked data gateway, right? So that when you, the person starts typing, it types ahead, everything feels exactly the same to our cataloger but when they select that name, this is the name that I'm talking about, it's grabbing the name and the URI. And it's saving that into the mark, right? Saving both those things into the mark, it's effectively invisible to the cataloger. They, have, they don't have to know anything about linked data, they don't have to do anything different. Here we modified our Qualiole, but uh, also I've seen demonstrations, we use Alma, so Ex Libris that I'm familiar with, they have a linked data pilot going on and I've already seen demonstrations of the Alma interface that will do this, right, work for you. So the barrier of entry here is for step one, a phase one, you have to have a modified cataloging interface, a workbench that does this URI grab, that instead of talking to your local authority file, either talks to a new kind of authority, local authority that has the URIs there or better yet, just goes out and hits the gateways that are out there because that's what linked data is all about, right? And there's every reason to expect that this will happen in the very near future. Like I said, we know commercial ILS providers are working on this. And so especially if you're in a cloud-based ILS system, 
you know, there, you, there's virtually no tech overhead in implementing this. I mean, it just happens. Your catalogs don't have to do much. You just sort of can roll into this universe with very little pain, no retraining of your cataloging staff. Um, the next thing you have to do, though, this one gets a little bit harder, is you have to do some batch URI insertion. Because once we have that cataloging interfaces, that takes care of everything I do from this day forward, but I got a whole ton of legacy data that doesn't have URIs in it, right? So uh, about two years ago, the PCC formed a task group that was testing URI insertion in Mark, and uh, it, it did a couple of things. Number one, it just wanted to see would it break it? Like where would you put things? Would it fry? So they spent a significant amount of time just toying with Mark, finding places that were appropriate, and then seeing, okay, if we stick those in there, does it break the current ILS, right? Because it's not expecting to find that there. Turns out, no, they were actually able to find places where you can put the Mark that uh, seem appropriate from a Mark point of view and that don't break your current ILS. So, you know, we're, we're copacetic, everything's good. The next phase was figuring out, okay, how would we do that? And uh, I'm not going to go into the details of that. I would invite you to really go online, look at the reports that come from this task group. Um, Jackie Shea at George Washington University, they did a tremendous amount of work. They basically did their entire catalog. They worked out systems for doing this that cover a lot of it automatically, where the, the computer can really know, like with a very high degree of confidence that this is good and no human even has to touch it. Then it falls into your other pile of stuff that needs a human touch, right? So uh, realistically on this part, you have to have some IT technical staff because you have to run the various scripts that they have and you have to devote a cataloger to this process to be the human touch, right? It, it took them, uh, you'd have to look at the report, but I think they spent about six months converting their catalog to that. Um, it was fast for a test. My guess is it would take you longer than that to really go into production, right? Um, so this is the costly, the most cost heavy part of this phase one. When you finish that now, let's say you finished it, now you actually have all of your mark is set up for linked data. You've got URIs for all the pivot points. You, every new thing you do is capturing them. So even though you're still working a mark, you're totally set up for conversion, the last thing you would need to do to actually function in that environment is to set up some import and export APIs that work with linked data, right? So I can keep my mark, remembering that my model can be different. My model doesn't have to be a triple store. A set of APIs that know how to receive linked data and know what to send out can translate that. It can use either if they're baked in APIs to your ILS which again, several of the ILSs are already experimenting with and doing. Um, or the other thing that we've played with, and this really works, although it seems very inefficient, is an API to an API, right? If your ILS doesn't have that, it's, gonna, it's designed to receive a call and send it to you, you know, a certain amount of data. All you do is have another process that calls that, right? And then reformulates it as triples and sends it out. So at the conclusion of this, process, you really will be functioning in a linked data universe, but at a very low level, right? You, you have sort of minimally viable RDF that you're communicating with the rest of the world. Your catalogers are working in Mark, but they're capturing some linked data stuff. But you haven't, there's no net gain here in terms of the quality of your records or efficiency to cataloging. You're doing everything the same way. The only gain is you could talk to other libraries who are also moving in that direction to a bib frame world, right? So that's, and that's not nothing, it's important. Uh, but it's only, to us, it's only an iterative step. But if you're a very small library, you don't have a lot of resources, um, you know, this may be where you stop for some period of time, actually, and you could function with a universe that is really moving to full-blown linked data. Phase two is designed to really move into that complete, complete linked data ecosystem, right? So it's where we move from phase one to phase two, and completion of phase one is crucial to this step because we need the URIs already in the mark to start the transition the way this plan roadmap works. So the first transition here, the step one of this phase two is to iteratively translate to completely linked data native cataloging. And when I say iterative, what really is the crucial part here is we, 
we looked at this from various directions, but like on Tuesday, the 24th, 3 p.m., switching your entire, entire cataloging effort over to linked data is uh, very painful and prone to error. It's difficult to pull off at a training level because you basically have to be training everybody at the same time or in iterations, um, and then you throw a switch and you hope your process is nailed and you've got it right. There's no real chance for learning. It either works or it doesn't, and then you're in a bad spot, right? Because in that in-between time, you, you, not a lot of work is getting done. So a much better approach to this, however you have your metadata services organized, is you can, in this world, we can move in chunks. We can move, and I'm going to talk about the technology in a second. I can just take a group of four or five catalogers, one cataloger who's worked doing a particular kind of, of work, and I can say, okay, I'm going to transition them first. And the other people can stay in their Mark universe with the interface that they're used to. And that allows us to walk in. Uh, it's way less disruptive, and it also allows you, when the first iteration goes bad and you learn what you learn, to then apply that to the next iteration. It gets more efficient with each small incremental move. When we, so we're, as we're moving people over, what we're doing then is moving them to a whole new interface, a whole new view for cataloging that is really designed for linked data, right? And so it opens up a lot of different possibilities. So the one I'm showing right here is the Library of Congress Bib Frame Editor. It has a, uh, a lot of things in it that are really modeled around this new Bib Frame universe, the new data model. Right, so uh, like the first thing you see, I'll just the very first thing is, is this an instance of a work, right? It has baked into it this work instance model. Um, it, and it, but what it does in this case, this approach, is in order to uh, you know, ease the transition, and I would say actually ease the anxiety, <laughs> personally in a lot of ways, it uses those labels, the RDA labels that people are familiar with. Catalogers see this, that it's not so jarring and so different, and it makes for an easy transition, and it will uh, pump out base perfect bib frame, right? I mean, it's good and it's there. This version is the online version. There is a, according to the website, a, a next bib frame 2.0 version that will actually be downloadable software. Yes, okay, Sally's giving me the nod. Yes, so that is still happening. Um, and that will make it much more efficient, right? It would be hard and it would probably get a denial of service if you tried to like, you know, ping this with your whole catalog. But when you can bring it down, run it as your own software, um, it's a great interface. Um, another one I'll show, we've been experimenting with, uh, it looks very similar, this bib frame scribe that was developed by Zafira, one of our partners. And it is very similar but takes a slightly different user interface approach and that it doesn't use any of the RDA labels. It just says jump into this new world, right? A title's a title. I don't care what kind of title it is because I'm gonna go out uh, you know, and pull variants of the title ad infinitum as they show up out of the linked data web, right? So it tries to basically get you as a cataloger to throw away a lot of your assumptions that may or may not be necessary in this new world. Um, I like it, it's cool, but it, admittedly it's jarring to catalogers, right? So realistically we're probably in a migration space. I predict ultimately we get to this other kind of world, but starting with that Library of Congress interface that looks very familiar is, uh, is a good idea. We also experimented with some barcoding, sort of really trying to improve efficiency. So for copy cataloging, we built this little phone app that you just scar score, uh, you scan an ISBN, and it talks, goes out to OCLC, you know, says what work is this, and through a series of pings between OCLC, Library of Congress, we're actually able to build the entire record on the fly. A lot of the times without any human intervention. If it gets to a point where it needs disambiguation, it just asks you which one of these is it, boom, you hit a button and it keeps going. But it's really easy, really efficient, and more of these kinds of new tools really will lead to efficiencies in cataloging. Now the one thing I talked about that I mentioned is in order to make this work, to iteratively walk through, we have to synchronize, this has to synchronize with your current ILS. That's the complicated part of this issue, right? So setting up one of these workbenches, not a lot of time involved, works well. This is the part that's expensive for phase two. So the model that we have, and I'm not gonna talk about the whole thing, uh, and my laser pointer doesn't work on these screens, so I can't, it's hard for me to really walk you through. But basically, here my mouse, you see there's a series of connectors basically. So when we're working in a linked data cataloging interface, we're pushing to a triple store, and then we have processes that watch 
that triple store, and they will push a Mark version of that into the regular ILS with an API. By the same token, we built things that are watching the ILS, and they're pushing triples back to the triple store, which we can do because we're putting Mark. We're putting URIs in our Mark, right? They're thin records, but it works, and it keeps the two things in sync, and that's how we can just move one thing at a time. Move it over, everything's cool. There's no disruption of service on that model. Um, the last thing we have to do here, or the second thing, is we have to batch convert. Same as in the last thing, right? We have to run processes to convert. What's my time looking like? Um, I'm good. So I'm gonna talk about a couple different tools to do the batch. Again, key factor here is the, we have the things we need to do a basic batch convert, because we have our URIs, we're there, we can start moving legacy stuff over into our triples. Again, Library of Congress transformation tool. It will, uh, right now, like uh, the cataloger, it is online version right now you can test. Also, it's coming out as a standalone version for Bibframe 2.0 that you can run locally, right? And so you can use this service to transform your existing records. It will, uh, not surprisingly, give you really good Bibframe. Um, and so it's, it's a very good option if that's your complete linked data universe. Uh, I haven't had a chance to play around with it en enough to know what would happen if I wanted to try to throw in other namespaces. Like let's say I had CDOC CRM that I wanted to use to describe a different kind of physicality about things, right? Um, so this is one option. Uh, second option is Mark Edit, which most people are familiar with if you work in, in cataloging. It's Mark Next capability. It has a very cool ability to do transformations. So it'll read in the mark, and then it uses XSLT for those people that know what that is. So you have these standalone files that you write. You don't have to touch the program in any way. It basically says take this, put it there, and convert the record how you want it to be. Um, it's very flexible because of that, because you can just write multiple transformations. Like this XSLT turns it in to Bibframe. This one turns it into whatever. Um, you know, you could have a thousand of them and keep doing it. And Terry Reese has set up a communal um, Git for all those transformations. So they can be shared, right? So there can be community work on those. I don't have to build a specific transformation on my own if somebody else already has. I can just use yours and we can share those. So it, it, highly flexible. Um, it's conducive to community working together. Uh, the downside for this is that it really is, uh, you have to be in a Windows universe for it to work well. I use it all the time, and I do use, there are versions for other platforms. Uh, I use it on my Mac, but uh, it, it is buggy. And, and I don't blame the product for that. You know, it, it's, Terry's building this, and you know, Windows is his world, and so why, you know, it, it's fair enough. But you should know that, right, if you're gonna go in. A similar product, but that isn't bound to an operating system, is this extensible catalog. And Extensible Catalog works as a web service. So it runs under uh, a servlet container. You can run it under Tomcat, Jetty. And it, it runs as a web. So you set it up. And you, it has an admin interface that's a web page. You go in and you point it to an existing catalog. It'll do an OAI PMH connection to your ILS, or it will read Mark XML. And you set up this call and you tell it, I want you to pull this every day, I want you to pull it every month, whatever that is. And then it uses separate JavaScript files, just like the XSLT and Mark Edit, where you define your transformations. And what you do is you say, okay, check this every day. Anytime there's something new that you see or a change, then you run the transformation and kick out the, the triples on the other side. It would transform it to anything, but in my case, we use it to transform triples. What's nice about it is it does synchronize in that way because it's continuously polling on your schedule, so it handles updates and changes that might happen on the other end. Um, so the, the downside to this product is it's, uh, in terms of disk space, it's very, um, takes a lot of disk space. It, it basically, you end up with at least three separate versions of your catalog. You've got your original version in the ILS, the way it works when it does its polling through AIPMH or Mark XML, it saves a whole separate version in, in SQL, and that's how it does its transactional processing, what's changed, what hasn't. And then you have your triples version you put out, and that can turn into a lot of data um, for a full library catalog. You also have to have a 
much higher level of technical expertise in-house to run this. It's, um, you know, it takes a server administrator to put this in place and make it work. But you kind of set it up and then you can walk away and, and the flexibility is cool. You also could write homegrown scripts. Uh, my opinion, there are very, very, very few libraries for whom this would be a good option. Number one barrier, you have to have people that can write them and you're essentially starting from scratch for all your transformations. But if you have in-house expertise and you are in a situation where you wanted to pump out data a lot of different ways, you wanted to do different kinds of cleaning while it was on its way out, um, you know, this, that's the, the time that I would implement this, is if you really have some souped up custom stuff you wanna do. Otherwise, we have tools and I wouldn't wanna spend a lot of time building your own, going your own road here. Vendor services, I want to talk about. Um, where have all the vendors gone? Not really that they've left because we're new to this space, but this seems to me like a ripe area for a vendor service, right? We already share how we get through WorldCat, how we get catalog records and OCLC in general, and you know, we, so there's a, already a system set up where someone else has a record and we, we get that copy of that. Um, that seems to me that we could do the same thing here. Right, and so we're not all converting the same bibliographic record 3,000 times. Uh, or also, um, someone to literally just handle the batch conversion as a service. So Zafira has done that for several libraries where they just go in and they handle the process of just doing the entire batch conversion. And uh, so there's a service model there also. And I, I hope, I, on this one I don't wanna say I predict, I hope there are vendor people in the audience and I hope you see the value of the business model of this service because it would help us immensely in terms of bringing the whole community over and not just those of us that have in-house tech departments that can handle the you know, more complicated stuff on our own. Step three for the conversion is another iterative loop and this is the iteration where we deal with all of the systems that talk to our cataloging data. So we get to this point, this could run simultaneously with iterating through your catalogers also, but um, the idea here, this is UC Davis, we drew this up, that some 40 different systems that in some form or another touch our catalog and that data, right? That they have to know what's there. That's a lot of stuff to move over. And again, if you just tried to do this all at one time, it would be disastrous. It also wouldn't be cost effective because what you'd have to do is bring in a whole bunch of short-term staff to try to get everything done and, and move it over. So it doesn't make any sense. So again, with our iterative model, this, this hybrid where we're talking to both universes, you can just do this one system at a time, right? And then when that one, if, if you have a problem, if it doesn't work, as you've built new connectors for it to talk, it, it's very, you know, you haven't lost a lot. You can roll back that one much easier than you could roll back another, you know, 39 or 40. And you can learn something from that first one that you can apply to the next one. You get better and more efficient with each one. Um, so this iterative plan really is the way to go. Again here, because lots of these systems we share in common, other people are using them, we have an opportunity to publish the transformation services that we come up with, many of which will initially just be connectors, right? This thing's expecting to get data this way, now my data looks like that, so I just have to create a go-between, a little API that, that delivers what's it want, what it wants and vice versa. We can share those. There's no need for us all to build those, and uh, so I'm hoping we will do that. Timing-wise, let me go to the next slide and I'll talk about timing. Once you've finished all that, you've converted everything over, your cataloging is now fully linked data, your, all your systems are talking to your triple store, you're, you're good to go, you can now turn off. All you have to do is just turn this off. Shut it down and you're working, you're fine. And you know you're working because you've already been working in it, right? That final, what used to be or could be a terrifying step is not so terrifying because you actually no, you've got several months, probably a year of time working in this other environment so you can feel safe and good about turning that off and it's not a major point of disruption. Now this phase two obviously relies on a lot of things that have to get written, technologies that don't exist so much, right? Um, 
this is the part where, again, I put in a pitch, but I really do have faith and confidence. Enough people working in this area, even at, at Davis, I mean, it, we're two years from phase two, best case scenario, right? At getting, and we're highly motivated, maybe one year, you know, depends on how motivated I can get McKenzie. But, <laughs> you know, we have a limited budget, right? So we can only move so fast with stuff, right? But, you know, there's, there is time, and as we're involved in phase one and we're functioning, there's every reason to expect that, you know, in a variety, both open source and commercial systems to support phase two will come online. Uh, you know, I really, if you build it, they will come. If we're all now operating in a data level there, I really do have a high level of faith that that will happen. Um, the couple other things I'm gonna talk about, what's my time? Okay, yeah. Um, just because they are the uh, kind of pain points in this that everybody asks about, I'm not gonna get into big details about them other than to acknowledge that they're there and that there are potentials and solutions. So the, one of the big ones is discovery layer. You know, we keep seeing these kinds of graphs, however they get developed, but that's not a full-fledged linked data discovery layer. And there was a panel earlier today on uh, moving into new types of discovery, and I think a lot of work still needs to be done there, right? How do we really formulate a discovery layer that capitalizes on this? But again, I think there's time. We, we've got multi-years before we really got to that point to build things and test. Right now, your options are, uh, you know, black light on Lucene and solar, which will index the, the triples is a good option. A lot of people that do do linked data use that. Um, there's also a close cousin to black light, a product called Colex that was a Mellon funded project for many years. And we actually just last night at about three in the morning rolled out <laughs> the, the working latest iteration that, that Mellon's been funding that is total triple store based and it brings a lot of different faceted kinds of browsing and just it's, it's different than Blacklight. It's really not better, it's a different sort of approach to the information universe. So, um, but that's open source software, it's available, you could use. The, so I think we'll get there on discovery. The last thing I'm gonna mention is the big authority control question, right? Which comes up regularly and it comes up for a good reason because uh, it has to change. The way we do authority control now just doesn't work in an environment where people are minting triples, they're writing triples, they're minting their own URIs potentially as part of that process. Um, so what, what happens here, just as the example, so this is our linked data um, workbench that I showed before. And let's say, so here I'm typing Shakespeare in, I, I find it. It's in Library of Congress, that's great and I select it and I've got a URI. The problem is when you get this, right? There's nothing, there's nothing there. I, I have two choices. One is just stop cataloging and put that on shelf. We don't wanna do that. It's very inefficient. It doesn't let us capitalize on this linked data universe. So what most people uh, agree is that, th that we will mint local URIs. Some people think they will mint a local URI no matter what for every entity and then just connect it with a Library of Congress or a VIOF or wherever it comes from. Um, so we need systems to manage this authority control process. Uh, and one of the models that's coming out of here is some point, whether it were commercial or whatever, some reconciliation process, and that's my third party in the middle. So if we're all minting our own URIs, different sources, but we're contributing to a aggregation and reconciliation process somewhere, and we already, this is what Viaf already does, and it, you know, it says there's this version of the name, this one, those people have said it's this, and these are all the same thing, right? We're just doing the same thing, but we're doing it with URIs. Um, Cornell University right now has an IMLS grant that's looking specifically at this project, or at this problem. There's a lot of really smart people working on that, and I, this, is, this is a very much a solvable problem, and out of that will come a solution. So it's not as scary as people think it is, and the good news is, like a lot of linked data, that solution will happen mostly behind the scenes. So it's not something your catalogers are really gonna have to, to deal with, unless they actually are a reconciliation cataloger, which could happen as a whole job. But, um, so it, it, it is being handled, it's there. Um, so last, that's gonna pretty much close. I would encourage you to keep track of the Bibflow blog. We will put the entire roadmap up. Um, it'll probably be because I have to convert it from its printed form to, you know, bloggy form. So uh, around the new year that it will come up there. And at least from my perspective, our IMLS funding is ending on this, but I definitely consider this roadmap, you know, a living roadmap. As we march down this road in implementation, we will continue to update 
as needed so that other people can learn from you know, what we're doing. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and say thank you and we'll take questions if there are any. Before I turn it over, oh, thank you, Carl. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Before I turn it over to questions, I just want to make a few uh, closing remarks. One is a lot of people say, well, you know, so what? We can do this, but why would we bother? And I have to remind you that a lot of libraries are investing a lot of money in the systems that we have today, the workflows and the staff. And again, we're not achieving the real benefit of the value of that data that we're creating so expensively. This is a way out. It's a way to inform the vendor community about what we need going forward. It's a way to enable next generation discovery systems that you've been hearing about. And it's a way to become much more efficient and effective so that we can free up resources to do new things like catalog data sets and stuff that we're just unable to get to now because of these pretty antiquated workflows. So um, what is inspiring to me is that there is now this way we can kind of see of how over a few years you can get from A to B. So even though we're down in the weeds talking about technology that we all find very boring because it's really old and you know crusty like Mark, it, this is really important. You know, it is the way we get out of the situation we're in now and work with the vendor community and with each other to move forward. So. We would love to hear your questions about this and encourage you to approach us about how we can work together as a community to make this happen. Thank you.